welcome to another edition of Cracking the Cryptic. Um, today we're going to try and crack the diabolical Sudoku that appeared in Daily Telegraph this Friday. Um, these are normally quite difficult, uh, about as hard as uh, I've, I've seen in a daily broadsheet. So without further ado, let's take a look at it. Um, okay, we can place the number, oh, place two numbers. And a couple of pencil marks. As usual, the pencil marks in any 3x3 three three block mean that a number can go in exactly uh, two positions within that block. That's the first interesting thing. Look, we've got a 1 4 double uh, in this 3 by 3 block here. Um, so we know we're looking for 6, 7, 9 in the 3 remaining spaces. If we have a 9 here, no 6s and 7s. So we're not going to be able to go further using that. Now, this, this sort of thing though, it should always make you suspicious. Um, you know, this looks like it's by design, doesn't it? This one four combination. Um, so it might be worth us just testing um, or just at least thinking through the alternatives based off, you know, if we pick a one here, what happens? If we pick a four here, what happens? And it's quite interesting, actually. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to work this through in my head, which is probably not not the most sensible way of doing it. But um, I'm, I'm going to actually show you. Um, let's say that this square here is a four. You can see immediately that would make this square a four and this square a four. Okay, so that's if this one is a four. Now, if on the other hand, this one is a 4, well, again, you can see that this one is a 4, and this one is a 4 again. So, whichever way we did that, this one was always a 4. <laughs> um, so, let's remove those uh, pencil marks that we don't need to use. So, we know that this over here is, in fact, a 4, either way round. And that might help us to make further progress. We can place a couple of fours here. Place fours in these two positions. Now we should definitely look at uh, this line. So we need one, two, three, and six now. Okay, well, we can see we can now place a three here just by simple Sudoku rules. Um, and we can place some more pencil marks here and here. That's going to give us a three in this position. And we're getting another double down here now, which is nice. See the three nine combination. Um, so again, we've got this well five six seven to place without without much help. Place the fives here, and that's going to give us a big five down there now. That's something. Four. We can place ones in these two positions, ones in these two positions, ones in these two positions. Ah, now here we go. Here's something else. This notation uh, that we recommend, this is one of the main reasons we recommend it. Let's take a look at threes in rows eight and nine now. We've managed to lock the threes in this three by three blocks into one of these two positions. And we've got the same in this 3x3 three three block now. Now, hopefully it's obvious to everyone. Let's imagine this was a 3. If this is a 3, this square here will be a 3. There'll definitely be no more 3s then 
in rows eight and nine. If, on the other hand, this was a three, then this will be a three. So again, no more threes in uh, rows eight and nine. So we know in this three by three block now that the three has to go in row seven. It has to go either go in this position or this position. That's the only cells that a three can now go in this three by three block. And look, we have a three up here. So in fact, we're able to write this big three in here, and that gives us this three two, which is useful. Um, you can also note there's a uniqueness point here. I can't see how to immediately use it, but it's no longer possible for these two squares for this configuration to emerge. If the nines were locked into these two cells here, you can see that now the puzzle has two solutions um, because the threes and the nines can go either way round. Now we know this is going to be a good sensible puzzle, so that won't be the case. So in this block here, the nines are a little bit restricted, but you can see we have, we've got so few nines affecting this three by three block that we can't actually make any more logical deductions off the back of that. Um, let's see, let's go for eight there. Let's see here. Eight there, and that gives us an eight here. Look, um, so that's useful. Let's put that in. That now allows us to place this eight as well. Um, and an eight over there. So two, four, six to place in this section of the grid, which we can't do anything with. Six and nine double along column eight again. Some that's the sort of thing we need to remember. I'm not allowed to notate this using the notation method that we recommend. It's one of the downsides of it. Six, seven, nine along here. Ah, yes, look, there's a hidden nine here. If we look at row seven and ask ourselves where we can place a nine, you can see this nine here prevents it from being here. This nine here prevents it from being here. So we can place the nine into that cell. And that allows us to immediately place that one and that one. Wow, and that one, that one, that one, and that one. Oops, I don't need to write that. I need to put a three. Put a three. Thank you. Uh, goodness me. So in fact, I'm now wondering whether the the trick we did with the fours up here might actually have been critical stage to solving this puzzle relatively painlessly, um, which is certainly a nice change for these diabolical puzzles. So, Okay, one, six, seven down here. The sun's come out. And we get a nice one, two pair now. Uh, again, the notation coming to the four. That means we can place the six and the sevens like that. Okay. Fives here. two positions. This square has got to be a six or a seven. We'll use that somehow. Okay. Now, I think we might be able to now make progress looking at column two. Okay, yes, we can. We need to look at the interaction of column two and column five. Um, and the reason for that is there's actually a really beautiful bit of logic we can do here. It's not that difficult to spot either. You can see um, in, in this block here, that we need a five, six, and seven. We've managed to pencil mark fives in, but um, 
this, this square here can take a 5, 6 or a 7. So we need to think about how that interacts with this 6, 7 pair in, in column 2. I'm actually going to break with my notation here to really emphasize this. I'm going to put the 6 and the 7 in just so that we can see it. Now, one thing that you might notice if you're looking at this arrangement of 7s and 6s is that they are close to an x-wing, i.e. if this square here, let's imagine that this square was the only place um, in column 5 that could contain a 7. Then, then this would be an option here, and we would have a classic X-wing shape on the sevens. And similarly, if, rather than a seven, if this was a six, we'd have exactly the same X-wing shape. What would that mean? Well, that would mean that we would be allowed to eliminate from every other position in row five and row eight all instances of sixes and sevens. Okay. Now, here. We, we don't have that exactly, but we sort of do. And let me try and explain why. I'm, I'm going to, at the end of the video, I'll actually add some color to make this clearer. Um, so we've said that if, if this square was the only position in column five that could take a seven as well as this one, then we would have an X-wing. But what if it's not? What if it's not? If it's not, then the seven, if it's not here, could only appear in one of these two positions. Obviously that's no longer an X-wing, but that still has a very profound effect on this square and on this square, because in this example now, the seven cannot be in either of these squares. So whether the seven is, if the seven's here, it can't be in either of these two squares, it can't be in this square or this square because of the X-wing. If it's not here, then it's got to be somewhere in the column, so it's got to be here or here. And again, it can't be in either of these two squares. Remembering, of course, if the 7 was here, then that would force this to be a 7 because of the 7. This can't be a 7. This would be a 7. So again, that, that's why this logic still holds. So using this, we're able, even though there may not be an X-wing, this is called, I think this is called finned X-wing, but it, in, in this, uh, this sort of um, setup of the numbers, it's quite easy to spot it because of, of this square here. Um, and then going up into this column where the sitting, you know, we're not seeing a six or a seven in any of these three squares. Now, we can use exactly the same logic with the six. Uh, so again, I'll just go through it once more just so it hammers it home. If the 6 can only go in this position and this position in column 5, then we would have an X-wing on 6s, yeah? And we couldn't have a 6 in this square, and we couldn't have a 6 in this square. But what happens if this isn't a 6? If this isn't a 6, where can the 6 now go in this column? It could only go in one of those two positions. If it was here, if the 6 was here, this would be a six, and again, neither of these squares could take the six. So let's assume the six is in is in one of these three positions. If it's not here, and there isn't an X-wing, it has to be here or here, but again, that would have the same effect on these particular two squares. So either way around, this square and this square cannot contain a six or a seven. Now, what therefore could they be? Well, they could be a one, you can see that I can't see anything restricting them from being ones. Let's put the ones in. They can't be twos because we've already got twos in the box here. Can't be three, can't be four, can't be five, we've already got fives in the box. Uh, can't be sixes or sevens for the reasons we've discussed at length. Could be an eight, can't be a nine because there's already a nine in the box. So in fact, using this logic, we're able to identify this one eight pair in this row. Now I imagine that is going to be useful. Let's just see. Yes, it is. So immediately you can see that now this forces this to be a 1 and this to be a 4. That puts this to be a 1 and this to be a 2. And all of a sudden we're starting to uh, cook with gas again, i.e. We're, we're making much better progress. Lots more numbers. Uh, put the big 4 in over here. Do that. So 
now we've got two six. And maybe the six and the seven into these positions. You can see now we have a seven up here, and that's going to allow us to actually place a six at last. And that will, I think, finish the puzzle, I imagine. Six and a seven into those two positions. This now has to be seven. Let's get rid of that six there, otherwise that's going to be confusing. You can see now this has to be a six, seven, five, and five here. there uh, and the puzzle I mean it is solved I mean by all means uh, do watch to the end but this is this is not uh, it's not going to be rocket science from from here on out so you've got one and six into those two positions one and two here can only place a two oops can only place a two in that one well that's got to be a one that's going to be a one that's going to be an eight this has got to be an 8, 5, 6, 7 to place, you can see that can only be this way around, 5, 6, 7 like that, 5, 1, 1, 6, 6, 2, this has got to be a 2 now, 2, 6, 2 and 7, and there we go. So a really interesting uh, puzzle actually. Um, we, we saw how we were able to make very quick progress using a quick deduction on this one four pair over here and then a beautiful bit of logic towards the end to crack the puzzle open. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it please do subscribe to the channel, please like the video, uh, please leave comments and we really welcome the feedback and we'll see you again soon on Cracking the Cryptic.